So how might we define a Christ awakening? Well, I guess there's a lot of words that have been used over the years. Renewal, revival, reformation, restoration, revitalization. How about this word, revelation? God giving his people a fresh revelation of who his son really is. It's sort of like what Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. If I had to pick one verse to describe a Christ awakening, it would be this verse. For the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And then he ends by saying, in the face of Christ. In other words, the God who spoke a word and brought the whole creation into being wants to speak into our hearts a revelation of the glory of of who he is by showing us more of his son. So it's almost as if we're looking at him face to face. You know, the Puritans had a great phrase for what I call a Christ awakening. They talked about the manifest presence of Christ. They say Christ is always among us, but there are times when he manifests his presence in whole new ways. For example, when you go to a theater to see a play and you're handed the playbill, you can read in the playbill and you'll see the essential plot of the story. You'll see who the main characters are, and that's well and good. But if someone said to you, well, since you've got the playbook, you really don't need the play, you'd say, oh, absolutely. I've got to see the play. I'm here for the moment when the curtain is pulled back and everything I read about in the playbook comes alive on the stage. The same thing happens in a Christ awakening. We've been reading about Jesus. We know about Jesus. It's all here in the Bible, of course. But then the Holy Spirit does something among God's people that in a sense pulls back the curtain and there comes the manifest presence of Christ. I've seen this going on in one of the the, the most famous maximum security prisons in the United States. East Jersey State Prison is famous because, for one thing, it's been used in a lot of movies, not the least of which was recently in the movie Ocean's Eleven. But there's a movement of God going on in that prison that's much more exciting than any Hollywood film. There's a movement of God literally among hundreds of inmates inside that prison who are turning to Christ, who are banding together in the worship of Christ and in the service of Christ. When I go there some evenings in order to preach, we'll have a worship time that will itself last an hour, and you could never make it any shorter than that because all of these men, hundreds of them sitting there, are that thrilled with who Jesus is. Why, we've seen miracles take place. Like recently, uh, the godfather of one of the gangs in the prison and the godfather of another gang in the prison, both of which had been warring with each other, both of them came to Christ, and both of them were baptized together on the very same night inside that prison. Well, one time a while back, I said to the men as they were all sitting there before me, I said, you know, I think we need a vision statement for what God's doing inside this prison. I've come up with something. See what you think about it. And here's what was the vision statement I gave them. I said, East Jersey State Prison should become as famous for Christ as Wall Street is for money, as Pittsburgh is for steel, as McDonald's is for hamburgers. And they all laughed, and they all loved it. And I brought it back to them a few other times, and they said, yes, yes, yes. The chaplain, who's one of the real explanations of what God's doing in that prison as he labors there day after day, tells me that sometimes the prisoners pass each other in the hallway, and they say to each other, just the first part of the phrase, as famous for Christ, that's what we're praying for, that God would do a work inside this prison that would give such a revelation of his son that when people think of East Jersey State Prison, they won't think about prisoners or bars or crime. They'll think, first of all, about Jesus. But that isn't just for prisons. That's for any church anywhere. Why could this not be the vision statement for your church? That God would do a work in the midst of our people that would give such a revelation of the glory and supremacy of His Son That when people think of our church, they won't think of the preaching or or the choir or the youth programs or the building. We will become as famous for Christ as Wall Street is for money, Pittsburgh is for steel, McDonald's is for hamburgers. Well, that's another snapshot of a Christ awakening. But Christ awakenings have filled the history of the church. You know, the great church historian Kenneth Scott Latourette in his classic seven-volume study of the history of the Christian movement out of Yale University, came to the conclusion that basically you could describe church history as waves of the sea washing up the shore with an incoming tide. 
There are times when the waves move up the shore. There's times when it seems to recede. But then a, a, another wave comes, and, and it comes even further up the shore than the last one because in the end, the tide is coming in. And time and time again, those waves that wash higher up the shore are coming out of Christ awakenings in an individual life, in a, in a small group of Christians, in a whole generation of Christians sometimes. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan scholar in our country, considered one of the greatest minds our country has ever produced, saw that reality about church history when he wrote these words, God has had it much on his heart from all eternity to glorify his dear and only son. Universal dominion is pledged to Christ. Even so, there are special seasons God appoints to that end when he comes forth with omnipotent power to fulfill this promise and oath to his son. These seasons, he's talking about Christ's awakenings, are times of remarkable outpourings of his spirit. They prove the reality of Christ's kingdom to a skeptical world and serve to extend its bounds. Here's my first experience with a Christ awakening. I was the pastor of a church adjacent to a major university, Kent State University. I stood on the campus the day National Guards came on campus when there was a student demonstration and they turned and shot and killed a number of students and wounded many others. It changed the course of events in our country. It changed the course of history around the world. And I stood there and watched it all happen. And our church found ourselves then in the midst of a revolution like we'd never known before. And the only thing we knew to do was to pray. And so a group of the men gathered with me and we met for six weeks of prayer, many nights a week. And we prayed through the book of Ephesians, one chapter for each of the six weeks. And basically we prayed that God would do in our midst what the book of Ephesians says he wants to do in the life of all of his people. Well, we saw many answers to prayers over the years I remained in that position. We saw literally hundreds of students come to Christ over the next four years. We saw many of those students graduate and be flung out by the Spirit all over the world in one, one capacity or another. But if you were to say to me, David, what's one of the biggest answers to prayer that took place out of that prayer meeting? I would say <laughs> it was what happened in me. I had my own very first Christ awakening. The whole church did too, but it began inside of me. Because you see, the book of Ephesians is really a glorious portrait of the supremacy of Christ. And you cannot pray scripture and get it out of your mouth and up to the throne without it coming back into your heart and transforming your life. So in those six weeks, I was reintroduced to God's Son. And the reason I did with, the, with those men what I did on the mall in Washington, D.C. was directly tied to what God did in me many years earlier in that little prayer meeting. But it isn't just happening in churches long ago. I've just finished the last few months working with a major church of about 1,600 members in, in, in the Midwest of the United States. And I've worked with them week after week after week, and we have seen a Christ awakening throughout the entire congregation. Everyone has awakened to Christ in whole new ways. It has permeated everything they're doing in the church. They've changed their, their mission statement. They've changed how they, they guide and govern in the church. They've changed how they design their Bible studies for small groups. They changed their whole perspective of what their mission is to the very ends of the earth. I've actually watched a Christ awakening transform an entire congregation before my very eyes. And the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for others, he can do for any church anywhere. So based out of all of that, my experience, church history, the scriptures, my definition of a Christ awakening comes down to this. It's when God's spirit uses God's word to reintroduce God's people to God's son for all he is. Let me describe it this way. In the 1990s, Kellogg's cornflakes discovered that after about 100 years, their cornflakes weren't selling like they used to. So they began a whole new advertising campaign. And there were different scenarios, but each one would end with somebody with a bowl of Kellogg's cereal taking a bite, but not knowing they were eating Kellogg's cereal. And when they took a bite of the cereal, there would be this great big smile on their face. And then a deep voice would come in underneath to end the ad, and it would say, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, taste them again for the first time. And guess what? The sales took off. 
When I think of a Christ awakening, when I think of the Christ institutes, I could say it this way, Jesus Christ, let's meet him again in a way. It feels like the first time. I mean, we, we think we know who he is, but there's so much more. Notice I have the word reintroduce. It's when God's spirit uses God's word to re introduce God's people to God's Son for all that He is. Now, what I'm trying to say is we're not living in a spiritual vacuum. Jesus is among us. Jesus is working in our lives if we really belong to Him. That's not the question. The question is that we, we may need to be reintroduced to all that He really is. It means that a Christ awakening comes and intensifies and accelerates. It enriches and deepens. It expands, extends, multiplies, and fulfills all that Christ already is doing in the midst of his people, even when they may not fully recognize it at the moment or even fully recognize him. A Christ awakening reintroduces us to life at the center of who he is, where he is headed, what he is doing, how he gets blessed. A Christ awakening takes the bottle full of water but flings it out into the supremacy. We start living in the reality of who he is, where he's headed, what he's doing, how he's blessed. And that transforms everything else we do. It's almost like a reconversion experience. This is Robert Weber, who, before he died just a short time ago, was the foremost theologian of worship in the evangelical church worldwide. Now, mind you, he's a theologian of worship, and yet he writes that midway in his ministry life, he had this Christ awakening. He had this reconversion. He writes about it in one paragraph specifically in his book, Majestic Tapestry, when he writes these words. He says, my view of the work of Christ was severely limited. It wasn't that I didn't believe the right truth. I simply didn't understand how far-reaching and all-inclusive the work of Christ really was. When I discovered the universal and cosmic nature of the work of Christ, it was like being born again, again. I was given a key to a Christian way of viewing the whole world, a key that unlocked the door to a rich storehouse of spiritual treasures, treasures that I am still handling in sheer amazement. Sounds like someone who got some King Jesus glasses, doesn't it? He was reintroduced to God's Son. Recently, I spoke to a statewide men's conference in Vermont, and about a week later, a young man about 29 years of age uh, wrote me an email talking about how he's going back over the CDs of my messages. And then he went on to say, and I have a newfound desire to become consumed with Jesus every day. It is amazing how waking up every morning, I feel like I'm being reborn. This new focus on Christ has clearly changed my life. I have a burning excitement that I've never had before. And even Jonathan Edwards, who gave leadership to what church historians call the first great awakening in the midst of a Christ awakening among his own people, writes in 1737 that he was weary and decided to get on his horse and go out in the woods one afternoon just to relax. And while he was out in the woods with his horse, he had a John on the Isle of Patmos kind of experience. Jesus revealed himself in a new way to Jonathan Edwards in terms of Jesus' supremacy. And Jonathan Edwards writes in his journal about that experience these words. He said, I had a view that for me was extraordinary of the glory of the Son of God. Now here's a man who's written books on the person of Jesus. And yet he says, I have a new view that was extraordinary. I see him as mediator between God and man. The person of Christ appeared ineffably excellent with an excellency great enough to swallow up all thought and conception. I felt an ardency of soul to be, I know not how otherwise to express, to be emptied and annihilated, to lie in the dust, and to be full of Christ alone. Now, Jonathan Edwards didn't do that for himself. That's a work of the Spirit of God. 
A Christ awakening is when God's Spirit uses God's Word to reintroduce God's people to God's Son for all that He is. Now, you may ask, well, is there any hope that such an awakening could ever happen in my life, let alone in my church or in in my generation of God's people? And I want to say to you, there's every reason to have hope, and here's why. There is a prayer movement that's been building across the nations over the last 30 years. It is the greatest prayer movement in the history of the church in terms of its magnitude, in terms of its diversity, in terms of its intensity, in terms of its focus on what I would call a Christ awakening. And when people start praying like that all over the world, you know that this isn't being stirred up by something inside my flesh. This is a prayer movement being stirred up by the Spirit of God. He's showing God's people how to pray, and you can be sure he doesn't have us praying like this in order to disappoint us. He intends to answer us. That's how we've been praying in New York City for so long that we're now getting ready to celebrate our 25th Pastors Prayer Summit, where last year there were over 300 pastors gathered. And over the years, we've spent hours together praying over our city and over our churches for three full days every January. And that's just a small part of the prayer movement in New York City. There's the Global Day of Prayer that takes place now on every Pentecost Sunday, where millions of Christians around the world rise up and they come into stadiums and into center cities and into churches or gather in homes and they spend time on that day praying specifically for a Christ awakening. This is going on every year on Pentecost Sunday right now. You say, well, wait a minute. (laughs) With all that praying going on, then where are the answers? Where is the awakening we've been praying for? And my answer is very simply, the answers are given and they're sitting in our pews right now. What do I mean? Let me illustrate it. I bet you don't know where this picture comes from. This is Death Valley in Southern California. Now that's how it normally looks. You notice it's called Death Valley because when you go out there and you look at that, most of the time it just looks dry and lifeless and useless and barren and hopeless. But a few years back, Southern California came under torrential downpours that lasted all through the winter so that even Death Valley itself became saturated with rainwater. And on that particular spring, when people went out to Death Valley, this is what they saw. It blossomed like a flower garden to the horizon as far as the eye could see. Why, there were flowers blossoming there that hadn't been seen for years. There were some identified that had not bloomed in Death Valley for 20 years. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that most of the rest of the year, when you went out there and it looked like this, underneath the soil, what you could not see with your eyes, there were little seeds still full of life hanging on. Some of them have been hanging on for 20 years. If they get sprinkled with a little bit of rainwater, that'll never be enough. They've got to be saturated, which is what happened that year, and then they can spring to life and be everything God made them to be. When I speak to churches across the body of Christ and I look out on an audience on a Sunday morning, I know sometimes you can look at your congregation pastors and you can say, it looks pretty lifeless, it looks pretty hopeless, it looks pretty dry, But I want to tell you in answer to this movement of prayer around the world, our pews are filled with people like those seeds in the desert. The Spirit has put life in them. There's a hunger. There's a yearning for more of Christ. They don't even know what it is they're longing for because all they're getting is a sprinkling of Jesus. They've got to be saturated with the truth of who Jesus really is. Like we said at the beginning of this session, Christians don't know how much their hearts truly long for more of God's Son until you show them, until you saturate them with much more of His spectacular supremacy, what they have not yet seen. That's why I have an abounding and growing hope for a Christ awakening in this generation. And there are many Christian leaders around the world who are feeling the very same thing. 